Good afternoon. Welcome to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. I run the International Security Program here. Uh, we have a great panel uh, to discuss the important topic of reporting in Pakistan, which is now, as many of you know, uh, one of the most dangerous countries in the world for, for journalists to, to work in. Uh, we're very honored to have uh, Caddy Martin, who is a longtime board member of New America Foundation, was instrumental in New America Foundation's uh, decade, decade and a half of, of growth. Uh, she's on the board of uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists. She's also the author of eight books. Um, and she has just recently returned from a delegation uh, that went to Pakistan, met with Nawaz Sharif, the Prime Minister. On that delegation was Joel Simon in the blue suit at the end here, who is the uh, director, the uh, executive director of CPJ. Um, and uh, in between them is Reza Rumi, who uh, is a well-known Pakistani journalist. Uh, he's an uh, author of multiple uh, books um, and also a uh, contributor to the Friday Times, the Express Tribune, uh, Express News. He's one of the most well-known uh, uh, TV personalities in <coughs> Pakistan. He survived a assassination attempt on March 28th, uh, a very serious assassination attempt, uh, which happened about a week after Caddy and Joel had left uh, their discussions with with the Prime Minister and their tour around Pakistan, which was well covered in the Pakistani press about this important issue. And so we're gonna have sort of a conversation uh, between the three of us, the four of us, and then we'll open it up to your, to your questions. So, so Kadi, starting with you, mm. tell us a little bit about the, the content of your conversation with Prime Minister Sharif, of what he said and um, the takeaways that you have from the, that conversation. Joel, chime in as, as, as needed. Yes, please. Well, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, hello, everybody. Um, first, let me, let me just say um, how pleased I am that, uh, that New America uh, continues to engage in this, in this really important uh, conversation about Pakistan and about journalism in, in Pakistan. Um, Pakistan, however complex and uh, sometimes deeply upsetting and even annoying to the United States government, uh, is, um, is, is a vital partner. And my husband always said that um, in the AFPAC uh, equation, a phrase that he coined, um, really it should be PAC-AF, <laughs> and that Pakistan was the important, was the more important mm. factor in that equation. And, um, and indeed it is, so we have to continue, like it or not, to be engaged. And, uh, and for us at the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, the situation for, for our colleagues there is dire. And, um, and we, um, we are going to stay on top of that. And we um, are determined not only to give He's very brave. I, he, Reza doesn't like it when I call him the bravest of the brave. <laughs> he says he doesn't want to be the bravest of the brave, but indeed he is. And um, people like, like Reza, who, uh, who really uh, risk their lives in, on an on a almost daily basis to cover events in Pakistan, are what stand between, uh, between an, uh, a purely authoritarian uh, government and uh, and they and an aspiring democracy. So essential not only for us as journalists to have people like Reza free to do their jobs in security, but essential for the United States government's interest too, because there's only one thing that 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 separates a democracy from every other form of government, and that's a free press. So. Uh, so this is not just a, a, a minor issue. It's, it's at the core of uh, American engagement in, in Pakistan. And um, although Pakistan is one of the most dangerous places uh, for journalists to work, as Peter noted, it, um, we, we had an extremely productive mission and uh, came away feeling that, uh, that the trend was in the right direction. And, but nothing is ever simple in Pakistan, as, <laughs> as, as all of you Pakistani watchers and Pakistanis know. It's, uh, it's one of the most complex places in the world. So uh, to return in a long-winded answer to, to Peter's question about uh, the meeting with Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, uh, 
It was uh, an extremely, in both tone and substance, an extremely positive uh, meeting. And I've, I've been doing these missions for the Committee to Protect Journalists for 20 years and have, have done them in, in, in some of the most unpleasant places in the world, because where else do journalists have trouble? Um, and I must say that this was the most positive meeting I've ever had uh, with, with a head of state in that there was no defensiveness, no, what are you talking about? You've got the wrong facts. Here are my facts, which, are, uh, which diverge from your facts. None of that. No pushback from the prime minister. On the contrary, he was well briefed on the issues that we raised and very of a mind to, um, to accommodate our, our um, we had a wish list, and he added his own. And, uh, and the conversation did not stay in the confines of, uh, of, of his office, because the following day he uh, repeated the, the, uh, um, officially the concessions that, that he had made, which, which, uh, which I'm about to get to. Um, and I think I, I um, had a very distinct feeling that the Prime Minister understands that Pakistan's global image has really suffered as a result of the murder of journalists, the impunity with which that is happening. And by, by our uh, count, it's 47 journalists. Uh, murdered, targeted specifically for doing their job. So we're not talking about people caught in a crossfire, but these are targeted assassinations of the, uh, of the sort that, that, thank God, Reza dodged. But oh, he's, he's going to tell you the very dramatic story of, of how he escaped the assassin's bullets. Um, so the, the, the Sh shall I go on? I don't want no, to. No, hog, no, 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 exactly. Hog the air. No, 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 you're not hogging the air. We've got plenty <laughs> of time. So, so what did you, so, what so did you to, ask him for? So, um, and Joel, please feel free to, if I, if I miss something. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, we, the, here are the things that, that, that uh, we agreed to with the Prime Minister, or that the Prime Minister agreed to. Um, the formation. Of a, um, of a of a new body, a council to be uh, to con be made up of, of representatives of the government and the media, and uh, a, sp a special body that will be sort of a central switchboard for cases of um, abuse of journalists and journalists who feel threatened uh, will now have a place to go, uh, kind of a a hotline, if you will, with journalists on it. And, and uh, the Prime Minister immediately uh, appointed um, the third member of our delegation, uh, Ahmed Rashid, whom I, I'm sure most of you know, the distinguished Pakistani journalist and author, to be the first member of that new body. And, and Ahmed uh, uh, agreed with, with only a little <laughs> reluctance, <laughs> but anyway, he's on it, and and um, and they're going to. Um, I think they've a appointed um, some government officials as well. So that's a body information. Additionally, um, he, the prime minister, also uh, announced the f the um, a special prosecutor to deal with cases of uh, of uh, both murders and other attacks against journalists. And I forgot to say, please turn your cell phones yes, off. Yes, indeed, including <laughs> <laughs> mine. <laughs> including yours. Um, and so one central special prosecutor and then four regional special prosecutors to deal with cases of uh, attacks against journalists. Um, additionally, he agreed, uh, after we pointed out how, how painful and, and, and uh, cumbersome it is to get visas for American journalists, uh, or Americans in general to go to Pakistan, he, um, he immediately turned. Ah. Yes. That's yes. interesting because that sort of follow up <coughs> question there is you know, yeah. if you're an American journalist going yeah. to Pakistan, you, know, you get these Islamabad, yeah. Karachi, Lahore visas yes. only. Right. Yes. So was he open to. Yeah. That's a very big issue. About yeah, it. Yeah. it is. It is I mean, we, we, we mentioned that, and, and he, without committing directly to that specific thing, talked about how important it is 
that journalists come to Pakistan and cover the country and cover it in a diverse way. And then we specifically, we did ask him about the issue uh, involving Declan Walsh, the New York Times correspondent who was expelled uh, from Pakistan and has not been allowed in. And, uh, and we asked him to try and resolve that situation. And he did commit to doing that. So it was in that context that we, we talked about these issues. Huh. Yeah, so um, I think those were, oh, and, and in, um, in the upcoming, um, if they indeed take place, uh, negotiations with the Taliban, uh, we asked that he put the issue of, um, of uh, journalists' rights to practice their profession unhindered, and, uh, and he agreed to that. So um, as I said, nothing is ever a straight or smooth road in Pakistan. And the week after we left, um, Raza suffered an attack. Well, so Raza, what happened? <laughs> well, I think, um, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, what happened is, I mean, uh, um, is nothing uh, I would say extraordinary given uh, what is happening in Pakistan in general and then the figures that Kati uh, mentioned, 47 or so. And if you look at other, there's a newly launched uh, report by Amnesty mm -hmm. as well, which also cites yeah. some, some uh, rather yeah. ghastly uh, cases of uh, journalists under fire. So, I mean, you know, the irony is that I've, I'd been writing about that and speaking about that. And to be a victim of all of that was the kind of... Uh, uh, most uh, d d dramatic part of it, and uh, yeah. basically, I'd left my my television uh, show uh, in the evening, and I was going home, and uh, uh, at a corner of a dark sort of uh, street, uh, which leads to a market, uh, there were some assassins uh, waiting. And this they, is in Islamabad. This is in Lahore. In Lahore. <laughs> in Lahore, and on the night of March twenty uh, eighth. And uh, they uh, sprayed bullets. First of all, they targeted the driver who was uh, taking me home. And he, I think, instantly died because they were very, uh, I mean, they were trained assassins. And uh, thereafter, you know, my instinctive uh, reaction was that at the sound of first bullet uh, was that I uh, thought that, you know, oh, finally it has happened what I'd been dreading. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had received threats and I was told in January that uh, uh, my name was on the hit list of the Taliban. Who told you that? Uh, that was, uh, you know, the Taliban posted it on their website to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> That's nice. Very, very, very thoughtful. Yeah. The wonders of the internet. <laughs> so you had a heads up. I had a heads up and then there were all these, uh, you know, messages on social media, and emails. And, my, and the group which I had joined in January, the Express uh, group, which is uh, both a television and a print um, medium, uh, uh, sort of company and they were also under attack so they had been attacked I think thrice before that. When you say they've been attacked, explain. Uh, well I mean in, um, in early January uh, their uh, crew in Karachi uh, was attacked and three media workers lost their lives. Uh, the bureau chief in Peshawar, uh, somebody had planted a bomb outside his house. He found out in time, got it diffused ah. so he survived. And then there was a random firing at the Karachi office again uh, in late 2013. Huh. So this part of a pattern relatively recently. There was part of a, uh, yeah, it was part of a pattern. And the paper were they targeting Express or were they par targeting particular journalists? Or it's not clear. Uh, well, I think I think they were targeting they were targeting the whole uh, group uh, um, yeah. because they were like uh, yeah. uh, you know um, attacking different offices in different places. And so, uh, so because I had this sort of uh, subconscious fear, uh, and people had been warning me that don't say this and don't do this and don't mm. cross this line or that line, and so I immediately, Im immediately ducked and uh, sort of uh, lay down on the floor of the car. And there were almost seven bullets which were uh, fired towards me from the back, from the side, from below. But because I had, I was. Flat. I flat and well below the kind of aim that uh, that the shooters were taking, I survived. What sort of vehicle was it? This was a, a, a car, a Toyota Corolla car. And How many uh, bullets did they fire? They fired over 20 bullets. Uh, 12 shells were found by the police. <coughs> but uh, they were, because they had sprayed bullets so randomly as well. I mean, th and these were submachine guns. So... 
uh, you know, they had basically, they were trying to ensure that the target was achieved. Uh, but sadly, they failed, uh, happily for me. <laughs> <laughs> for me too. I'd say sadly. we're all happy. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, uh, one has to empathize with, <laughs> with, with all, you only know. A that was, <laughs> only a journalist would say that. So. Really, I, yeah. I think that goes too far. <laughs> that that, that goes a bit yeah. too far. I, I, I admit I was What was your being, family's reaction? Well, obviously, the family was completely traumatized because, you see, I had a safe career with... Uh, the government of Pakistan, that's how I started. I was in the administrative service. And then I went on to the Asian Development Bank as a governance and policy expert. I left all of that to do journalism in 2008. I mean, yeah. one of the, the colleagues here, he knows me in my, from my pre-journalism days. And uh, uh, so I did that l largely because with the return of democracy in 2008, I thought there was increased space for public engagement and sort of correction of the, of the narratives which exist in Pakistan. Uh, particularly in the vernacular press and and the television, uh, where you had all these conspiracy theories and and uh, la laundering of various extremist ideologies, and I thought, well, now is a democracy, and things are looking up, so it's time to jump into the fray. So I I was writing before that, and that that's and one of the good things about journalism in Pakistan, right? Yeah. I mean that there is, I mean, and that's a sort of Musharraf legacy. That's one of the few good things that he did. Yes, he did the deregulation of media and and this whole opening up of the industry. And you have nearly ninety uh, TV channels in yeah. Pakistan. You have over one hundred and twenty-five FM radio stations and six hundred plus newspapers. It's a thriving, booming industry. Yes. This is the paradox. This is the paradox. So on the other, on on the one hand, you have this uh, this huge. Um, you know, quest for freedom of expression, free expression, yeah. reporting, etc. And on the other, you have all these um, elements, you know, both within the state and particularly the non-state actors. And importantly, you were mm. reporting both in English and Urdu? Or? Yes. I was, the, the television engagement for the last three years, you see, that's what got, it, got me to trouble because I was writing in the English press, uh, you know, reporting and op-eds, etc. Which no one cares about. Nobody really cares. I mean, you guys read it, actually. Right, right. But, but, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that's Religiously. <laughs> yeah. It's what's said in the Urdu press that is yeah. the problem. Yeah. So right. I moved on to, the te uh, to, to television because I thought that the audience was, was huge. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it did make an impact. And, and that's where, where perhaps you needed alternative voices and, and more uh, emphasis on facts rather than fiction and opinion. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, whatever. Why go there? <laughs> <laughs> why go there, exactly. <laughs> well, I, now I really uh, think, uh, why, why did I do that? But I think uh, it was a very fascinating experience, you know, to engage. Uh, I even had a show with one of the sort of clerics, uh, which I had started in, uh, in February. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and he was a, a hardliner, Deobandi cleric. And, you know, I was What's his name? Uh, Hafiz Ashrafi. Uh -huh. And, I mean, who's, who's sort of veering towards moderation these days on the media, but the idea was to have an engagement with him and have, an, have a discourse, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you can set things, uh, you, you, you can reset uh, the, the narrative through a, a dialogue, a discourse. But, uh, you know, I think some of the issues that I raised, uh, particularly on, in defense of the Shiite population of Pakistan, in, in defense of the Pakistani Christians, and other non-Muslim communities perhaps landed into, into trouble because the hardliners, the uh, extremist uh, fringe considers them as uh, infidels or ap apostates, and those who advocate uh, the cause of apostates are, you know, yeah. apostates th themselves. And that is a death sentence. Yeah. And you know, the punishment for that, according to some schools of thought, is death. And they don't really wait for a court to do that. <laughs> they they have enough ammunition. So I think I think this is the problem uh, that that the booming uh, free. Um, booming press um, as, a, as an industry faces is that the, uh, you know, the state actors are identifiable. You know, Pakistan has a history of, of media struggling against an, an authoritarian state mm -hmm. uh, under various dictatorships and, uh, you know, launching and, and um, uh, sort of um, finding uh, their space and, and, and quest for more freedoms. But the, in the last decade or so, the non-state actors have not just multiplied uh, but we've also seen a parallel uh, weakening of state writ uh, in grappling and tackling that challenge because there's so many, because there's a regional conflict, there's a domestic conflict, and, and there are zones of Pakistan which uh, you know, are uh, ungoverned spaces mm -hmm. uh, that you have more and more 
mushrooming and uh, sanctuaries of these non-state actors. And therefore, sometimes they are in league with the state uh, groups, sometimes they are autonomous or semi-autonomous. And so, it is very difficult to even identify, uh, you know, who attacks whom. So, the, uh, so right after I, uh, you know, I, I was at home for 10 days, locked up because the police told me uh, that they would come back, uh, they have missed the target and so you can't mm. leave the house. So, I was under, under virtual house arrest, not, not being able to go, lots of police outside and I wasn't really sure how far the police were compromised or not because, you know, you mm. don't know. There's a lot of infiltration of extremism in, 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 these, in, in these institutions as well. So, I uh, had no choice but to leave uh, Pakistan and because I have some family here, so this was an easier port of, uh, you know, refuge or <laughs> recourse. So, um, but right after I arrived, I think in a few days, the police arrested a gang of six people uh, uh, who belong to Lashkar-e Jhangvi. I did, who, are, who, are, who are they? Uh, and Lashkar e Jhangvi is a um, uh, is, um, uh, hardline anti Shia uh, extremist organization uh, with the clear aim to purify Pakistan of the Shiite infidels. So, your comments about Shiism may have been. Well, that, that mm -hmm. and the, com and the comments uh, and a lot of uh, advocacy for the Ahmadi community, yeah. which was excommunicated. Who, who, who are they? Uh, the Ahmadis uh, are a sect, uh, were a sect in Muslims in Pakistan who were. Uh, declared as non-Muslims by the Pakistani parliament in 1974. And they think they are Muslims, but the Pakistani state thinks that they are non-Muslims. So, all of us have to sign a declaration that I uh, denounce the Ahmadiyya sect and what they believe in. So, each time I have to apply for my passport or ID card, I have to sign that declaration. All really? of us have to do that. I did not that. know that. That is interesting. Well, yeah. well so, yeah. and so yeah. the Ahmadis, they, 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 their beliefs about Islam seem to be analogous to Mormon beliefs about Christianity. Oh, well, I mean, hmm. well, there is, there are, it's, they're quite, quite they're close, yeah. quite as, as, a, as an analogy, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, the issue is that, you know, my, my line always was that, you know, I don't want to get into the theological uh, aspect of it because they right. have been suffering lots of discrimination in Pakistan, lots of uh, you know killings uh, have have gotten uh, you know their way, and the the students are discriminated in in colleges, schools, etc. So I used to say these things even on the state television, and and the situation is worse now for minorities in Pakistan. I think it's been it's worse than it's probably ever been for Christians, for Shia, for, for the last few years indeed. Because and why we, is that? Uh, why I, th I think it has it has largely to do with the rise of the ta of the Pakistani Taliban yeah. and the affiliates in the mainland Pakistan uh, like Lashkar e Changvi or other uh, and, the, and here's here's where it gets complicated because these Lashkar these Lashkar parties or SIPA have some electoral uh, significance for Nawaz Sharif himself, right? Yes. I mean, mm. Well, thank you for mm. raising that. I think this is the this mm -hmm. is the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, again, a paradox and again a problem because Nawaz Sharif does want to, uh, you know, clean up Pakistan and has some good intentions or at least he had before the elections when people voted for him <laughs> in, in, in good numbers. Uh, but on the other hand, he's also tied down uh, mm -hmm. with his popular support base in the Punjab, some of which is linked to, to these extremist organizations. But really, uh, you know, I don't think it is that huge. Yeah. I think it is more of a fair factor because uh, uh, this particular group uh, has, uh, you know, uh, they did uh, face uh, uh, prosecution earlier. Uh, it is very difficult to prosecute them as well, by the way, because they eliminate witnesses and this scare yeah. the judges. So there have been multiple cases. If you Google it, you will find like dozens of such cases. But the problem is that the politicians in Pakistan are also afraid. They are under fear. And they, they have good reason to be afraid if they can yeah. kill Salman Ta uh, Tasir, yeah. Benazir uh, Bhutto, yeah. right. uh, of all the, of all the, uh, not, uh, and Shabazz Bhatti, who was this, uh, this right. Christian leader, yeah. a federal minister yeah. for minorities, and a real uh, uh, sort of, you know, the, the Pakistani Christians look towards him for, for uh, their redressal of their grievances, etc. And so, so there is a climate of fear that the politicians face. And so, therefore, they, they, their public narrative is that to appease the Taliban, particularly the Pakistani Taliban, because you already have to appease the Afghan Taliban. Do you think there will be an Taliban. operation in North Waziristan? I, I, I really, uh, I think a uh, partial uh, operation has, has already uh, started, but I don't see a full-scale operation going on, largely because of the fear of reprisal attacks in the Punjab, because the affiliates in the Punjab province, 
which is nearly 10 to 11, um, um, 100 to 110 million people in Pakistan, uh, um, you know, uh, that is where uh, the, the fear of uh, reprisal attacks is the greatest. Because I've heard that the military actually wants to do this operation now, which is, which is and the civilian li li leadership it doesn't want to do it. Is that uh, I think that is I think that is that is true to a to a great extent because the uh, there is a lot of pressure within the ranks of the military. You have nearly five thousand uh, military personnel uh, who have been killed in the last one decade. You have nearly five generals who were killed by the Pakistani Taliban and their affiliates. Th th this is even a greater tally than the three wars that Pakistan waged with India. Mm. And so, mm -hmm. therefore, you have this this really strange situation where the military is facing all these losses, there's a uh, growing pressure within the ranks to do something about it because they feel, they feel angry about this. And uh, the politicians sadly have a, sh have a shorter uh, time uh, period in front of them because they're looking at the election in the next three, four years. Mm. Uh, so they're looking for a quick fix. So if, if talks can deliver some sort of a hey, basic can you think, piece. Can you, think, can you think of a time when talks with the Taliban have ever delivered anything? Uh, I don't uh, think that, uh, I mean, I, I can't think of a time because I nearly half a dozen deals which were done by the military itself under Musharraf and later failed. Uh, and one was done in the past uh, uh, government with, in, in Swat, uh, which also foundered and then you had to go in with the military and, and uh, take so action. So are these talks just for preparation as a way of a public relations exercise to say, hey, we exhausted every option and now we're going to do the military option? Or do they really believe that they're possible? That, that the talks will actually yield something. You're asking me very tough questions. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, for no. which I'd rather. Okay, well let's let's carry let's, yes. let's, let's, let's go let's go to the next question, which is Hamid Mir. How, of course, yeah. he was you know <laughs> somebody I've known for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, in maybe, many ways, maybe, maybe not everybody's yeah. familiar with Hamid, Hamid, Hamid Mir. Ha Hamid Mir, you know, basically he's in a sense the Larry King of of, of Pakistan. Yeah. <laughs> um, if uh, but I, maybe I, a, a younger more Larry King. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, younger yeah. and maybe more serious as a journalist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, I think he's yeah. and I, you know, I first met him. Just a little bit of back background. I first met him when he was a essentially a Taliban sympathizer. I think it would be safe to say, he was mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. editing a paper called Al Saf, which is one mm -hmm. of the early languages, basically pro Taliban. Spit, you know, and this is back in ninety seven, and you know, over time he's evolved significantly. And I think that he's taken very brave stances on what the ISI has been doing in Baluchistan or the military. Pakistan army in general, disappeared people into the yes. ISI, yeah. uh, a brave stance against the Taliban. He survived a very similar attack in 2012, right, where there was a bomb under his car mm -hmm. in Islamabad. Luckily, he discovered it. Or he, so, you know, now he's in hospital. He's been seriously wounded, uh, or the pretty seriously yes. wounded, stable condition. Yes. So and tell it us. Was, it was just a week after. Yeah, um, daily. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 in fact, a few, uh, a fortnight after uh, mm. the attack uh, on, on me. You. Mm. and uh, my driver and, and the companion uh, I had in the car. So I think uh, me was attacked and, and again sprayed with bullets and uh, la unluckily, I mean, you know, he got six bullets uh, in his body and uh, most of which have been taken out, but I think there are two, two which are pro 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 problematic mm. and uh, they, the, the doctors are still grappling, but he's stable, he's, he's, he's conscious. And he's conscious, okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, he, uh, what happened that while he was taken to the hospital and because he had been uh, quite, pub, uh, you know, um, um, making these charges against the ISI on his television show as well, that because of his advocacy on the Baloch missing persons, you know, the insurgency in Balochistan um, has been ongoing for a decade now. And uh, well, isn't it like more like five decades now? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I think I think I think with this intensity, okay. uh, it is it is it it started under Musharraf after the murder of uh, Akbar Bokti, right? The separatist leader, uh, Baloch nationalist leader rather, and uh, the, it had died down prior to that. It had it had uh, kind of phased out, but it uh, was rekindled by B uh, Bokti's murder in two thousand and six. Yeah. And thereafter, it has been a very, very serious uh, sort of challenge to the Pakistan military. So the military has had to deal wi uh, with it in a rather uh, heavy-handed fa fashion. And uh, Hamid Mir was one of the uh, few uh, media persons who was regularly taking up the case of the missing young uh, insurgents. And again, he's doing this in Urdu. He was doing this mm -hmm. in Urdu and on, and on, on the TV. television. Yeah. And it's a popular program. In popular, the largest TV network you have yeah. in Pakistan. 
which so, is Geo, Geo. which is Geo Network. Yeah. And sadly, what happened is that while he was in the hospital, uh, his um, television channel flashed the pictures of DGISI for nearly eight hours, accusing. Uh, uh, and, and his family, his brother came yeah. on to the television saying that, that Hamid had said if something happens to him, it would be the ISI responsible. Now, you know, personally, if you ask me, this is poor journalism. Well, uh, uh, let's, let's back up one second. So DG of ISI is who? Uh, the DG of ISI is, the, uh, is, general, uh, is a military general who reports to the prime minister but is the leading... Uh, Sort of intelligence. And he's the equivalent of the CIA director, more or less. Equivalent or, of the CIA or, or, director. But it's a military precisely. organization. Precisely. And precisely. His, his picture was continually flashed, flashed for eight on, hours. on the screen, which okay. we also consider poor journalism. Yeah. yeah. Because um, we don't, uh, there was there, absolutely no there evidence. Was no investigation. I mean, it's one thing for Am Hamid Mir's brother, Amir Mir, to go on and say, I think the ISI is responsible. Yeah. It's another thing for the journalist at GEO to put up the picture of the guy yeah. who runs ISI. No, it's a highly provocative act. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, 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 it's, and, and what, it, what has happened is that, that it triggered a media war, an intermedia war. Because? But, well, I mean, I, I think that just backing up, yeah. Peter, going back to your first question, is going back, what's the political context in which this discussion is taking place? And I think these two incidents were almost like, they were almost written to highlight the challenges that the media faces and the prime minister faces. The issue of journalists killing in Pakistan uh, as an international issue is, 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 a, is a very significant challenge confronting the government. Certainly goes back to Daniel Pearl. Yeah. And, and that put this issue on the agenda as a global challenge. What are the risks of reporting these kinds of issues in Pakistan? And we know what a very significant this is, issue that the Pearl killing was for the Musharraf government. Well, after the Pearl killing, and there was a significant investigation and convictions in that killing, the killings continued, but the, but the journalists who were targeted were Pakistani journalists. Right. And there's a lot of attention now, thank God, for on, on, on these two incidents. But, but the that's reality is these are national going, figures, right? These are national figures. Right. And most of the journalists killed are not national mm. figures. And they're reporting yeah. in Baluchistan. And they're reporting in Baluchistan, or they're reporting in the, the Fata. In, Fata, Fata. in Fata, yeah. the yeah. tribal mm. areas mm. in Peshawar, or they're yeah. or but they're but, but they're serious about both of the, the officials. Pakistani officials are approaching both of these. Uh, incidents with with but, more but, serious. But I want to I want to put I want to put yeah. this in context. So so yeah. for 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 the, for the for the for the leadership, this is a problem. And I think that uh, uh, Noah Sharif came in with a relatively clean slate because yeah. he did not have an antagonistic uh, re relationship with the media. Yeah. Um, and the media was actually quite supportive of mm -hmm. his campaign. Mm -hmm. And I think to a certain extent, he owes. Um, his that election, election. No, I, mean, I don't know, I wouldn't go that far, but certainly the, the media and the, co the positive coverage of his campaign played a critical role yeah. in his election, and he realized that, and he wants to try and calm this environment. Well, what are the forces that want to subvert that effort? They are the forces um, uh, that attacked you, and they are the forces, you know, let's put aside the quality of the journalism and, 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 and for a moment, the forces that have been drawn into this debate in terms of the attack on on Hamid Mir. So these are the forces within Pakistani society that are setting the parameters of public debate. On, on, on one side you have the Taliban, on the other side you have the security forces and the ISI which define any criticism as a threat to national security. Journalists who cross those lines are threatened, they're targeted, and the question is, can Nomad Sharif do anything about this? Well, that, that raises a very good question, which is what are the self-imposed red lines that journalists, as a general rule, follow in Pakistan? Because there are, uh, I mean, what, what is? There are probably yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, <laughs> <some of laughs> I mean, obviously, you crossed over them. But I mean, to get, sketch it out for us. If yeah. I'm trying to like stay alive as a Pakistani yeah. journalist, what am I not what writing is, about or talking about? And 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 additionally to Peter's question, what effect have the attacks on you and Hamid Mir? What to what yeah. extent have they chilled the the media environment? Yeah. Um, in uh, as as a result of, of how different is it now than uh, than yeah. even when we were there a few weeks ago? Right. In in light yeah. of this, because yeah. there was. I'll, you know, we, we spent a lot of time with, with uh, your colleagues, and, and there was this sense of forward movement. Yes. To what extent has, has that now been chilled by these attacks? Well, I mean, I think uh, some of the questions, Peter, you were asking me on the military and, the, and et cetera, <laughs> yeah. are the kind of red yeah. lines, you know. 
uh, just to give you an example, to illustrate <laughs> right. yeah. on the spot, okay? Uh, but but I think I think in general, mm. in general, staying alive and staying safe uh, means that you don't uh, get into trouble or do not report freely or uh, on on the powerful actors. And you know, as uh, Joel rather. <laughs> Uh, you know, succinctly uh, put that, you know, on the one hand, you have the might of the state, the security forces, uh, the ISI, the IB, and the other intelligence uh, agencies. And on the other hand, you have uh, three kinds of non-state actors. One are the violent extremists. Then you have the separatists in Balochistan, who also, by the way, kill uh, and attack journalists. And the third kind you have are the political parties or the gangs affiliated yeah, I was say the with the political the parties. Yeah. And one of them, uh, one of the journal young journalists uh, of GOTV, again killed a few years ago, was killed by a gang which was affiliated with a political party in Karachi, the, the port city of Pakistan. And, you know, that thankfully that is the only trial which has been prosecuted and the killers have been punished. Well, right. Khan Babar. Yes, Babur, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, Bali I mean, that raises an incredibly important issue, which is like Benazir Bhutto's death has not really been properly investigated by any standard in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, we know who killed her. I mean, I think it's Bayatullah Masood would uh, overall. But so the problem is that the impunity, I mean, is, is, yeah. uh, you know, Salman Tazir's assassin was the guy who was his bodyguard, so yes. that was relatively easy. But I mean, do you have any confidence that whether it's Hamid Mir or in your own case, that the real people responsible will be brought to justice. Peter, this is one of the uh, one of the uh, greater dilemmas. You know, I um, I mean, I'm I'm positive that the government has arrested some people, but if I look at the the track record of our justice system in general, I'm not too optimistic. Yeah. And the reason is, it's not that there's no will to do that, but I think even. Even as a state, uh, Pakistani, uh, you know, prosecution and trial, uh, you know, uh, services have declined in the last two decades. And simple forensics are simple forensics are, are, are really uh, yeah. difficult. Very to primitive. They they yeah. they um, crime scenes are not taped off mm. typically. Right. They're, you know, evidence is yeah, is like like uh, Benazir Bhutto's case. Well, they hosted yeah. down, right? Yeah, half yeah. an hour afterwards. Yeah. So half an hour after exactly. So. Yeah. So here, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, if the, I think the real test of uh, of the Sharif administration, as you put it, uh, uh, you know, that he is keen and he has, he comes with a keen slate, etc., would be to get get these cases but investigated. Surely and that's prosecuted. something that the U.S. government could actually be quite helpful with. I mean, mm. we have a whole legat FBI sort of program inside embassies that provide technical assistance but, for but, this but kind Peter, of thing. It's, I, I think it's a political. It's yeah. you know, I yeah. mean, yeah. yes, there's yeah. you know, they, yeah. they, if they, you know, we we have evidence. With with the um, uh, 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 pearl killing, yeah, and and with the Wali Khan Babar case, that despite these tremendous obstacles, and let's be clear, in the Wali Khan Babar case, they were killing witnesses one after the next, six witnesses huh. killed, yet they still managed to convict people. Where there is will, there is evidence yeah. that they're able to solve these crimes. So this is a, this is a question of political will. But yeah. but if you want to go back to a sort of uh, another case that highlights the challenge, it's the Salim Shahzad case. Mm. Now, I happen to be in yeah. um, Pakistan. Well, tell, tell us what that case yeah, okay. is. Yeah. I, I, I will. I happen to be in um, Pakistan uh, in, uh, in May 1st, 2011. Uh, I arrived. Next day, the bin Laden raid came down. We had a... a, a they uh, knew you were coming. They knew I was coming. My, <laughs> some people were a little suspicious. <laughs> I can assure you I had nothing to do with it. Um, uh, but the next day, we had a, we had a meeting with President Zadari. Uh, a similar kind of meeting, and mm. we talked about some of the challenges, and I think personally, given his role, they were even more significant, but we had a very uh, positive conversation. And then I was there during this period in which this, this, this press that Musharraf had unshackled, for the first time, challenged these sort of uh, uh, issues that had never been discussed, the power and the, and the lack of accountability uh, by the military and the, and, and, and the, and the, and the, and the um, security agencies and began challenging them and then in a, in a very aggressive way and the ISI responded according to many of my colleagues I was speaking with by <laughs> you know inviting journalists to tea which is one of their favorite tactics and kind of telling them hey uh, you know uh, this is uh, you know just warning you for your own safety we're hearing some threats about you or or just you know these these conversations are friendly but they always have an edge and Shalim Shaz Shazad was one of the journalists who was probing most aggressively about the relationships. Yeah. Uh, well, can I, can I just go ahead, go ahead. make a point about Shalim Shazad? Yeah. Mm. 
which really is it's a form of a question, yeah. which is how accurate was his journalism? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But, but I think Can the question. Can I just say the, something the, yeah. on that, on yeah. the accuracy of. Um, I mean, you I mean, know, but, 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 you know, just, but, but, but let me just let me okay, just make one point because I'm just. And then I want to say. Um, yeah. about I mean, I don't I don't know the answer to that, but it yeah. was accurate enough yeah. that it got him killed. In yeah. other words, yeah. we don't know what's accurate, what's not accurate, but we yeah. but there's there's compelling evidence that that was a state operation. Um, so yeah. that killed him. So so yeah. either either it was accurate and they killed him because it was accurate, or it was not accurate and they were upset that it was inaccurate, we'll never really know okay, the answer. Okay, I just want to say yeah. right, right here that, that um, we, and, and we've already been critical of Hamid Mir's um, um, uh, GOTV flashing um, the uh, head of the ISI's image continuously as not being good journalism. And our uh, colleagues, uh, with with every respect in in Pakistan are not perfect. Only right. we are perfect. Right. That's a joke. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nobody's perfect. However, um, there is never uh, a reason to shoot journalists. Yeah. If you don't like their reporting, yeah. do a counter uh, report. Um, you know, write a letter to the editor, uh, or, or, yeah, or the various yeah. ways of or, or go on TV and say this guy didn't do enough investigation. Mm -hmm. You do not kill journalists as a as a way to express your dissent with with their reporting. So I, I just yeah. wanted to be no, that, that, perfectly um, clear about that before. But, we but, but I think I'd like to add. The burden on, on is on the yeah. killers. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I, I think Archie, uh, that is the issue that Salim Shahzad's journalism. Uh, raised a lot of questions. It also was controversial in many respects. But the problem is that you know there is simply no justification yeah. for what happened. Well, can, I, can, I, can I ask you then in more detail to explain the investigation and your conclusions and had they been accepted in any kind of official way by the Pakistani government? Um, I think uh, I, I think what what the Pakistani government did that the initial because Salim Shahzad had also done. Uh, he had sent out an email to the Human Rights Watch and a media house, the uh, chief editor of Dawn Group, mm -hmm. saying that if something happens to him, that he had been called in by the ISI and threatened, etc. Mm -hmm. And so that became the kind of circumstantial, uh, you know, lead towards the, the kind of state yeah. operation which which uh, people refer to. So in response to that, uh, you know, and, and it, it, it was very, very ghastly what happened because the, he had, his body had been buried. It was then searched. It was exhumed and identified. So it was, it, it was a very tragic case overall. And then a commission was set up, a very high-powered commission headed by a Supreme Court chief, a justice of, uh, uh, of the Pakistani court. And they deliberated for months on that. They came up with a report. But unfortunately, the, the report was not very clear because the kind of evidence and testimonies which were required to prove uh, that Salim Shahzad was uh, killed by elements within the state or otherwise was not there. So, uh, mm. But the good part of that commission report is that it did give some guidelines on the reform of uh, uh, Pakistan's intelligence apparatus as a whole. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis their engagement with media, and now after Hamid Mir's case, you know there has been some debate that uh, those recommendations are still unimplemented or, un or, or, or not considered. And the prime minister raised the case yeah. with us. He uh, did raise Salim it. Shazad. We 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 did not raise it, but we we uh, acknowledged the progress that had been made on the mm. Wali Khan Babar case, That's which right. which is significant. That's right. Uh, and then he said that we we have to uh, move on on the Salim Shazad yeah. case. So yeah. uh, I, I, I I think it's the U.S. government view. That it, it was an ISI operation. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and and I think mm -hmm. that's that's been fairly well documented. Um, I think I think Mullen, yeah, um, yes, uh, basically he made did. that claim. Yeah, yeah I, I think it was it was raised a lot by the U.S. government and perhaps, but you know, I mean, I just want to like uh, steer it back to <laughs> what happened within Pakistan is that the inquiry commission did interview hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, many witnesses came forth. Many people from the within the media came forward gave their te testimonies but you know this could not be established i mean i'm not uh, i'm not mm -hmm. i'm neither defending the isi nor 
are trying to uh, drag it into the. By the way, I'm glad you raised Danny Pearl because yeah. I mean, yeah. sitting on this dais and we were debating the question of what did the Pakistanis know about Osama bin Laden just uh, ten days ago was yeah. Carlotta Gould, yeah. who of course was mm. pretty badly roughed up Absolutely. Yeah. in Quetta by pe yeah. some kind of law enforcement types, right? Security. Did, did you ever? Would the CPJ ever take that case up? Uh, we knew about it, um, but Carlotta at the time decided, you know, not to make a. And but Declan is okay with you raising the issue. Uh, why I not, Why can't I come? I mean, oh he yeah, was, he oh was, yeah. Was, yeah. 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 No, I, I stopped yeah. off in London on the on yeah. the way to Islamabad to meet with Declan yeah. and and uh, get get and guidance from him on what he wanted. He practically and is, he's been in Pakistan so long he could have a Pakistani passport, right? Yeah. He's exactly. been there for eight years, and, and right? As a, so and as, a, as a matter of fact, he isn't. Um, I don't know whether this is the Times uh, articulated an official position, but Declan is not clamoring. To uh, to become the to to resume being the Times bureau yeah. chief in Pakistan, he j he wants to be able to go to Pakistan. Among other things, all his worldly goods are in yeah, <laughs> Islamabad. He was given 48 <laughs> hours to pack up, and wow. uh, the, the time that he spent reporting on the election. So he wants he wants the persona non grata status lifted, yeah. so that he can uh, come and go normally. Right. And and it's it's not a normal situation for. For Pakistan to to not have a uh, a New York Times bureau chief. Well, I mean, in even place. China doesn't do this, right? No, no. I mean, it's pretty. So yeah. what did, what was yeah. Nawaz, what did they, what did Nawaz Sharif say to you about? Well, that? he said he he was he was extremely uh, agreeable in in saying that that and and turned to the. Um, uh, Minister of Information next to him and said, uh, "We have to move on this, yeah. and and uh, I I trust that uh, that the the Times may not get uh, the the whole loaf that is reinstatement of Declan right. as bureau chief, but I I think that uh, they have a very good chance of of uh, he wants to do occasional reporting right. from there <laughs> after nine years of uh, investing his life in there. And so, Reza, as a practical matter, who would, mm -hmm. who would actually have to sign off on that if Nawaz said, we want this guy back? Uh, well, I think uh, the declaration of persona non grata for a foreign journalist would have involved the Interior Ministry mm -hmm. and Pakistan's intelligence agencies, yeah. which report to the Interior Ministry because they give clearance for foreign journalists, and in that case, uh, uh, largely the interior ministry. So, you know, I mean, I think, I think whatever we are talking about uh, brings in the fundamental issues uh, that face Pakistan, the civil military imbalance, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the, the uh, growing insecurity and the uh, issues of governance, and I think the security of journalists and media uh, as a whole is a segment of that. Mm -hmm. And right. perhaps, as Kati rightly said, that, that a free press is what makes a country distinctive in terms of its democratic credentials. So I think it is even more important for the Nawaz Sharif government and the civilian governments, both in the center and the provinces, to sort of uh, assert and prove that Pakistan is moving in that direction. Joel, question for you. Is the situation in India much better for journalists, or, or what? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's better. I mean, yeah. the, 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 it, that doesn't mean in, India has very significant challenges. There's a, there's a tremendous uh, disparity between the, the you know the the, the uh, national press and concentrated in the major cities. And uh, there's there is a similar dynamic. Are Indian journalists being targeted for being journalists? There, 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 there have been some killings. Organ you know there was one uh, killing of a of a, of a prominent um, uh, uh, journalist who was covering organized crime in Mumbai. So it's not unprecedented. But it wasn't and, and, a state and, and, and actually, the journalists who cover the Maoist insurgency mm -hmm. uh, have been attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, journalists in tribal areas face very significant threats. I don't want to minimize right. the challenges that journalists face in India. They're very, very significant. Uh, and India and gets a bit of a free pass. Yeah. A well, bit of Kashmir a free pass because different. it's got yeah. a very lively uh, and vibrant uh, national press. But they simply don't compare to the challenges. And how about Indian. Afghanistan? How about Afghanistan? Afghanistan yeah. is obviously, uh, uh, it, I mean, again, it's a, it's a, it's a different dynamic. Um, but we've had, you know, just abs two absolutely horrendous crimes uh, committed against journalists. In yeah. Three, yeah. three, yeah. three uh, yeah. journalists have been uh, gunned down in Afghanistan, um, uh, including uh, Anya Nidin right. House. I mean, was, yeah. I mean, just a horrible One of my friends, Kathy Gannon, yeah, uh, got uh, yeah. attacked. Uh, well, the, the, but yeah. there's a slight difference. I mean, I yeah. know Kathy, you know, I've been yeah. Kathy for yeah. 20 years. I mean, we they were targeted, I think, for being 
uh, Westerners. Westerners. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the Afghan yeah. journalist who died in the Serena Hotel was in the wrong place at the mm -hmm. wrong time. So I'm, I, I'm just asking for yeah. a sort of yeah. baseline. The situation in Pakistan is much worse than Afghanistan and much worse than India? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I would say that's Hence our, our laser-like focus yeah. because we're, we, we're going back. I mean, this okay, is, when are you going back? This is, well, we haven't scheduled I, the trip you, yet. But you get <laughs> frequent fire points at the Serena <laughs> Hotel in Islamabad? Or? But, I, but I just want to add that I think, I think uh, in the case of India, uh, you know, in the uh, state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, there have been many, many uh, incidents, and a lot. And I'm in, I'm in touch with a lot of journalists there who work there and who face a lot of problems with the security agencies in Indian held Kashmir. In Indian held uh, Ka Kashmir, and also yeah, the uh, the areas where where Maoist insurgency takes place. So I mean, I'm not trying to uh, to okay. to act as a typical yeah. Pakistani yeah. And, and, right. reaction yeah. to and, India, but yeah. I think just yeah. want to lay. And, and Peter, yeah. I, I'm not sure that it's helpful in this context to compare. No. You know, mm. Pakistan and India are comparing all the time, but you know. Well, I think it is. It's useful to say to Pakistan. Look, I yeah. mean, if you're if, the, if if part of the argument is that this is make this is your international image is suffering. That's and look, yeah. In that your immediate yeah. neighborhood, this is very unusual. That, that, I, yeah. well, uh, well, although, although one thing I will say is there's high levels of violence against the press throughout South Asia. It's, yeah. it's definitely Pakistan yeah, leading is, at the moment, is yeah. uh, uh, off the charts. But we have high levels uh, in, in, in Bangladesh, right. Sri Lanka. India journalists are killed more frequently than people realize. Again, no. does not compare mm -hmm. to Pakistan. But this, this is a regional challenge. Um, what can be done, by the way? I mean, Kadi and I were talking about yeah. this a little bit. I mean, we had, we had uh, Saba Imtiaz was a fellow yeah. here, and she's a Pakistani mm -hmm. journalist. And I uh, asked her to write a piece after the attack mm -hmm. on you uh, for the South Asia channel, which we edit out of here, for foreignpolicy.com. And I said, Saba, she described the problem. And I said, you haven't so, so, you know, provided any solutions. Well, we, well, there are there are some. Well, and I said some of the uh, some of the solutions yeah. I pr tried to pr suggest to her. She said, yeah. look, they won't work. So. One was, it, I learned from the, the guy who edits Pajwalk, which is the Afghan wire yeah. service, that if they do a big story on corruption, they do it as a collective with other, right, with other uh, journalists. That, and, uh, that is, uh, you've just nailed it. There, yeah. there is an absence of solidarity yeah. among Pakistani yeah. journalists yeah. That, that is really uh, weakening uh, the, uh, the entire media uh, picture. So, so that when, when one is attacked, the others yeah. attack the, the, the one who's been attacked. So, 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 I, so if I may add uh, yeah. a bit, I think uh, that is absolutely, you know, we have discussed the state and the non-state uh, uh, part of this matrix, but I think what the way the Pakistan's media industry has also behaved, you know, yeah. in the, especially, you know, because I'm, I'm going through this whole process in a month's time. For example, when I was attacked, you know, the other rival TV channels and media groups did not report yeah. as much they ought to have. In fact, they completely blacked out the news. After Hamid Mir, Why? well, because uh, because if it was very simple ratings game, if they would say somebody has been uh, was being assassinated in, on on the streets of Lahore, people would switch to my channel, and the profits and and the revenues would go there for for one week. That is insane. insane. It's well, as insane yeah, as that. Yeah, yes. yeah. And the, 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 <laughs> there's an irresponsible media uh, owner culture. Yes. Yeah. That yes. that they they uh, first of all. They don't. They don't provide minimal security for journalists. Mm -hmm. okay. They they don't provide minimal training yeah. for for um, yeah. how how to cover uh, highly um, uh, perilous uh, situations. Mm -hmm. There's no training. Okay, so that's There's, something. That's something yeah. they really These could. Fix. Yes, absolutely. Yes. These are these are tangible things. No life things. insurance. And no life insurance for for yeah. reporters who yeah. go into Balochistan yeah. or other difficult areas. Uh, they die, but, and but, yeah. but the, all but these things are important. But I do want to keep the focus squarely on of the government, course. and yeah, that yeah. Problem, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But there are things that the government yeah. needs to but do. But the but owners yeah. have responsibilities. Absolutely. You, and if, were yes. you able to have discussions with any of them? I, I've not in this trip. I've had many discussions yeah. with owners, and I've and what yeah, are they, the and the and the discussions don't go far. Well, you know, they they're they're constructive in the sense that they acknowledge constructive. I love you know, that word. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, like, this is a problem. Like you, you, of but, but, you know, but 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 no, great I don't euphemisms. I don't think they can be shamed. I don't, or they can't be shamed easily. Put it that way. Yeah. And 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 the. By the way, can I throw out an idea? But, uh, 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 just yeah. want to end this. Yeah. 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 Can I one quick idea, maybe controversial one. Part of the problem is a class problem. Yeah. Mm, uh, mm. That, pa yes, that Pakistan's journalists, are not, the journalists are not seen as sort of, uh, the, 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 is this an untrue uh, statement? That I there's a little bit like they're sort of like a different class and therefore we, they don't need to yeah. be protected and they're uh, not. No, I think, I think it's changed. Uh, that, that's changed, but that a decade used to, ago. But 
okay, mm. that, but that's mm -hmm. still part of the, if yeah. it's a decade ago, yeah. it's still yeah. part of the makeup. And, and Peter, I, I, have to, I have to say that part of the problem here, again, is the state and ISI's influence on the press and the relationships that they've forged that yeah. they, uh, they, 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 yeah. you know, let's, let's give the media some responsibility for this. This is yeah. definitely, yeah. Uh, but, the, but, the, uh, but, the, but the, the security forces have exploited this split, for sure. ramped it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the ISI has made a move uh, in the military to try and shut down. Wait, wait, we have to get Nick Schmidl in here for yeah. this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. since yeah. he was thrown but out of Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Nick, Nick, we're talking yes. Pakistan reporting. <laughs> <laughs> Nick is a fellow here and yeah. was and a New Yorker writer and was thrown out of Pakistan for his reporting, right? But but can I can I just return for a second yeah. to uh, to uh, our core um, interest in this, and that is uh, to 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 break the cycle of uh, uh, of violence against against journalists. The 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 key thing is to is to end the impunity. Yeah. And and how do you do that? You would do that by actually prosecuting the murderers. Yeah. And until that happens, yes, journalists will be absolutely. fair game. Absolutely. Until you see a guy being convicted of murder yeah. uh, for the crime of, of before we, uh, before hitting we throw a journalist. It open, I want to ask, yeah. so there's, there's a question about Hamid Mir here. Okay, so mm -hmm. like, as he, Hamid Mir leaves Islamabad where he lives, he takes a flight to Karachi and is attacked shortly after he leaves Karachi airport. That implies somebody who has access to airline yeah. schedules. This is not something the Taliban has some sort of database yeah. about who, I mean, so where does that lead you, Reza? Well, if you saw Declan Walsh's story, I mean, he mm -hmm. has cited some of the, the investigation he did earlier. And he said that, you know, even, even uh, a few years ago, uh, lashkar e jangvi had infiltrated the geo network and okay. was trying to use a reporter to murder an, an editor. Yeah. This is, I mean, yeah. he, right. he okay, found so it. And then, and then there was another case of infiltration by another extremist organization. So you see, what I'm trying to say is that uh, that while state ob state prosecution bringing uh, uh, the murderers to justice is very important, but I think the media of organizations also have some share of, of responsibility, and perhaps they they could learn a, a bit from other contexts. Uh, you know, in uh, in the way because you know after Hamid Mir's attack, the, it it was a time to stand together yeah. and perhaps you know negotiate and pressurize the state that you know this is not on. Uh, instead, what we have is that all the other media houses on one side and Geo TV is on one side, and Geo TV is now labeled as a as a traitor television yeah. network, which should be shut down because it's harming Pakistan's national interest and yeah. is a, and is an unpatriotic. Uh, uh, outlet. So you have this complete split now in the middle. Express calling for Geo to lose its license. Yes. Wow. I mean, where, where is, where is the, the, the all, all, collegial all channels, I mean. solidarity? And, and yeah. he was in the hospital, yeah. and there so were can, rival anchors yeah. were saying, "Well, look, why, why, the, why, why was the traitor not shot in the head? Why yeah. have the bullets gone yeah. in his leg?" I'm, so, I'm, I'm yeah. studying from Urdu. But who are who are these anchors? The, these are from the rival channels. They said that this this traitor channel should be immediately stopped, you know? So th this is not the ISI saying it, Joel. I mean, mm. you know, I want to emphasize mm. this yeah. point. Yes, yeah. Yeah. the state does have a yes. central role right. in our yeah. society, right. you know, in, in all post-colonial yeah. But uh, the problem context. has to be attacked from every, yes. from but every but angle. But the problem and is, what, um, how, what do you do with, the, with, with these media it? owners, yeah. with these uh, journalistic mm. bodies, which need mm. to have some kind of a conduct? Well, th let's get into the journalistic owners in a little more yeah. detail. Mm -hmm. I mean, who are they? Uh, well, I mean, um, first of all, what has happened is that, you know, we allowed cross ownership in early 2000 under Musharraf. What does that mean? So, well, basically, people who own big news, new, newspapers could open up TV channels. Kind of like Rupert Murdoch. Like and radio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. uh, following some of the bad practices. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, and uh, so what, uh, so five or six groups turned into these mini oligarchs. So Geo TV emerged as the biggest baron capturing about 60 to 70 percent of the market share of private TV viewing, of newspaper reading, circulation, etc. So that is at the top. And the rest of the 40 percent of the private viewership or media consumption is, is shared between other uh, media owners and who all want to act as the Geo TV. Which is owned by Jan Group. Which is owned by the Jan Group. Okay. Who, are, who are they? Uh, the Jang Group, uh, well, I mean, it's a, it's a business family from Karachi, uh, from Karachi. But the turning point was the anti-Musharraf campaign, because in 2007, when uh, Musharraf was uh, uh, getting weaker in the domestic political context, 
Jio TV ran a successful campaign uh, against Musharraf, and uh, we, you know, which ultimately uh, brought him down and made which him Which Hamid Mir played a key role then. In which Hamid Mir was central, yes. Mm. And, and in fact, because the, 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 the army was coming to the door of Jio TV to, count, to mm. close it down. Precisely. They, he did, mm. Yeah, it, was, it was shut down for seven weeks as well. Right. Uh, Musharraf did clamp down at that time as well, but ultimately Jio succeeded. Now this set up even a more dangerous trend in Pakistan's new media industry, where the barons, uh, you know, five or six barons thought, ah, we are the new kingmakers. We could bring down the governments or, you know. Ah. So this DGISI, uh, you know, antic was another, what has been viewed by some of the commentators as another sort of testing the waters uh, or, or leveraging your media power uh, mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. Pakistan's most powerful institution. So there's a, so you know, there's yeah. a bit of a, what is happening is that the, while the poor journalist on ground, the reporter or the anchor is, is in the crossfire of these various forces, yeah. the barons are playing a very dangerous power game with Pakistan's state centers. What would be, what would be the, 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 the way to get to the barons, to, to have a... I think a, a code a, of, I think a code of ethics. Uh, yeah. There's a broadcasting... But who could, but who could initiate, who could summon such a uh, uh, such a, a conference. There, there is a re regulator, which is Pakistan's Electronic Media Regulatory yeah. Authority, PEMRA, yeah. and PEMRA has has uh -huh. this mandate to, to convene. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I think it's a very weak re regulator, like other regulators in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So no mm -hmm. no no mm -hmm. surprises there. So PEMRA has a role. I think the uh, the journalistic associations like the yeah. C CPNE. Yeah. Uh, yeah. PFUJ. PFUJ have a role to yeah. pressurize. Yes. You know, they could they could always mobilize the union power or, yeah. or, or the collective power to pressurize the barons that, you know, they need to stop acting like like, 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 like small tin pot dictators in yeah. the Pakistani pond and get out and do something for their workers who are dying left, right and center. And does the or US have a the US is not very popular in, in Pakistan. We're not gonna get into drones, but um, <laughs> um, but that's uh, 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 certainly a, 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 a theme. If you spend any time in Pakistan, you engage yeah. in that conversation and, exactly. and, uh, and, and we're deeply unpopular. Um, it, does the U.S. Uh, have a role to play in this beyond? Um, I, think, I, think, I think the U.S. government, I, I would say no, because of the reason that you cited, because mm -hmm. it, would viewed as a, it, would be, it would be viewed as an external intervention, one more, mm -hmm. uh, one more plot of the CIA mm -hmm. to subjugate Pakistan. So I think, uh, so uh, it would way, be better. By the way, you coming here, is that going to be misinterpreted by I, some? I, I hope not, because I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I hope not, but then, you know. I think it's an issue. I think I've been to the worst. Yeah. You, you mean here to New America? <laughs> no, no, here no, to, here to the United to States. To yeah. two, States. Two dozen bullets, uh, I, I suppose, think. outweigh the infamy of okay. being in Washington. <laughs> 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 shall, I, shall I put it uh, that way? Okay, we're going to open it okay. up to yeah, everybody so here. So Can you wait for a microphone and identify <laughs> yourself? And uh, thank you very much. This gentleman here. Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I am a Pakistani journalist. An exiled journalist, Raza, welcome to the club. Are you from uh, Balochistan? I'm from Balochistan, ah. yes. Ah. Uh, my takeaway from the entire talk is, uh, I think, uh, the traditional uh, behavior of blaming the victim. Uh, th the gist of the whole conversation seems to be the, you know, that the media itself is responsible, the journalists have to regulate themselves. But I mean, 17 years back, and Raza and I, like our mutual boss, Najam said he was kidnapped from Lahore, and the blame was on the ISI. The ISI has been blamed for so long. But my question is, Raza, what do you think is going to be the aftermath of the attack on you? Will the Pakistani media be absolutely silenced? The way your newspaper, for example, Express Tribune, has not run a single op-ed about the attack on Hamid Mir. The television channels have blacked it out. So what is the aftermath? Will the Pakistani media, media be absolutely silenced, or will it you know, trigger a wave of you know, activism uh, for the media's pr uh, freedom? Because similar to what Kerry was saying, overly optimistic attitude towards Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif. It was the Ministry of Defense under Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif which moved the resolution that Geo Television should be shut down. So wh what is the democratic government doing about it? Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, I really don't know what is going to happen, but I mean, for sure, I think uh, my newspaper, which uh, where I write a regular column, Express Tribune, had already been under attack and, you know, they had even been asking me not to write on certain subjects. They would, you know, the editors would turn it down. 
and uh, surely it has been silent after Hamid Mir's attack. I think there's a huge disunion, you know, the media is divided. And that is why I was not, you know, towards the end blaming the victim, but I said that the media owners as businessmen, as corporate interests do share some measure of, okay, even in, in, a, in, the, in the smaller percentage, responsibility for taking care of their employees. And simply that contractual obligation is missing. If you send your people into uh, to, to cover a bomb blast site without a bulletproof vest or, some, or, or, or without the necessary equipment or a life insurance, I mean, what are you doing to people? Mm -hmm. You're exploiting them. And this is what's happening. That's the a, that's a real story of Pakistani journalism as well. You know, other than the high level, high profile ISI targeting Hamid Mir or Seti or whoever, you know, these are there. But at the same time, there are also these problems. So I'm, uh, uh, Saraj, I was trying to kind of make it more more nuanced, you know, than, we, we definitely than didn't want to give the, the guns after yeah. the journalists, yeah. you know, yes, yeah. that's true, everybody knows, yeah. but you know, there's, there's much more rot within the industry and yeah. that also needs a debate. But I think, yeah. um, I think at the moment, sadly, the, uh, there is a culture of silence. I think Kachi mentioned that after the attack uh, happened on me, well, whoever half a dozen or a dozen people who used to oppose the talks with Taliban stopped doing that. And there ah. was a silence, you know, there were more and more uh, sort of calls to appease the Taliban, oh, our, oh, our uh, uh, brothers who, uh, who have gone astray must be brought back and hugged for peace. <laughs> and they should be, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm translating from Urdu. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they are, they are the patriots who, who just have, uh, who have, uh, uh, you know, forgotten the real path and, and, they, and they should be talked to and negotiated with. So there is this narrative. And after Hamid Mir, what has happened is that also whatever critique of the military or military's policies uh, was there. It was it was uh, pretty robust, you know, as you saw after the, mm -hmm. the Osama bin Laden operation. Mm -hmm. You know, these were unprecedented. You know, so so the the paradox that we talked about right at the start continues yeah. in Pakistan. Yeah. Even the fact that Geo TV could flash the picture of DGISI for eight hours shows a little opening yeah. in Pakistan's media. But the gentleman from Balochistan raises an interesting question, which is if the Ministry of Defense basically officially says that we're, we're, we want GOTV to close down, mm. is that something the Wajd Sharif had any role in, or was it something that the Ministry of Defense did on their own? Well, I mean, you know, Peter, if I, you know, I would like to, Siraj, we have also tampered with our constitutional freedom so much that the Article 19 of Pakistani Constitution, which shows free speech, has a long list of qualifiers. <laughs> okay, we say every person has free, seat, free speech, un it. unless, unless uh, that you know you cannot talk about against the glory and integrity of Islam, you cannot talk against the defense and security of Pakistan, you cannot talk against I think two other subjects. There are about five qualifiers uh. to freedom of speech. So technically, in a very narrow sense of of, of Pakistani jurisprudence ministry of defense does have a basic case sadly that's how it is because they could make an argument that pakistan is in a state of war and and here's a tv channel uh, trying to defame its its uh, intelligence apparatus its military etc but of course you know in there are larger issues you know like like uh, the issue of uh, uh, democratic um, uh, space and and overall freedom of uh, of um, expression you know and there are other articles of the constitution so there are problems within the pakistani you know the way we have shaped our constitution as well that you cannot directly do that sadly i mean i'm, I'm, I'm for, for example there's something which was constructed by general ziaul haq in the 1980s called the ideology of pakistan nobody knows what it is i mean there are various definitions and it is a crime in the penal code to oppose the ideology of Pakistan mm. with a certain punishment. Mm. Mm. Just as a mm. lady just here in front. Side. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Hosefa Khanum. I'm from the Embassy of Pakistan. And I wanted to thank you all of um, thank all of you for your very interesting comments. What do you and do at the embassy? Um, I'm a foreign service officer and the chief of chief of staff for the ambassador too. Right. Mm. And he's looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> thank okay. You. So I was basically just going to say that, uh, of course, you know, there's no condemnation of killing of journalists in any case. Uh, but I just wanted to, since you guys were making comparisons, I just wanted to ask a few questions and get some perspectives. For instance, in the U.S., as an outside observer, uh, sometimes you see in the media when there's gun violence. And uh, it's never really debated in the media, for instance, the Lockheed Martin company that's based in Fort Worth, or like how much of the US um, economy is based on the defense 
equipment. And for instance, in India, like some people say that the media is not as anti-government as it is in Pakistan. It kind of toes the the government line in most cases. So I just wanted to get some views on that. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for your uh, question. You know, uh, there is so much that is wrong with our country, uh, our our United States of America. Um, and there are obviously many things. The India, too, has its flaws. But um, it, our, our mission um, is um, a very specific one. The Committee to Protect Journalists exists. It was founded by a group of American journalists who had uh, worked overseas and, and were um, very much taken up with the cause of uh, the, the problems that our colleagues were having overseas. We're the only organization that is uniquely focused on uh, press freedom issues beyond our borders. It is by no means uh, a statement of America's um, lack of, of, uh, of media uh, shortcomings. God knows we could have um, <laughs> A, a weekend <laughs> seminar. In fact, we on, did a discussion here about that issue not too long ago mm -hmm. with Len Downey he, yes, and, and yes. Rajiv Chandrasekharan right here yeah. about U.S. press freedom challenges. So it's something we, we, we do talk we about. We do talk about. Yeah. Um, but, um, and, and nor, nor, nor do we wish to act as, as uh, you know, preachers who land up in, in countries, you know, with, with, um, uh, with, with all the answers. We don't have them, but we are concerned about our colleagues in Pakistan. And, and that's, that's our reason for being. Well, but Joel and Caddy, uh, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't the, there was an American journalist killed in, in Arizona in the late 70s, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And he was, it was car bomb. Yes. Right. Now, didn't a consortium of yes. other, uh, all sorts of newspapers right. and TV stations basically get together and say, we are going to investigate yes. what happened here. And they basically that solved the case. Is that, yeah. or is that, I mean, mm, they, tell us, they, tell us. They, yeah. they, 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 they made, very significant progress, and we've seen uh, that strategy uh, uh, emulated sometimes with success and sometimes without success. A group of journalists from Paul Klebnikov was killed in in uh, in, in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. Tried to create a similar consortium. Yeah. It was very challenging. I've seen it happen in Colombia yeah. as well, where journalists have come together. Yeah. Did but it work in Colombia? Well, there, it, it, there, you know, there's always yeah. challenging, but there's more solidarity there. What I have seen in Colombia is different media organizations get together, work collectively on an investigative project, run the story simultaneously on the same day without bylines. Yeah. This was at the height of the violence. Can't see that happening in Pakistan. Can I just also say uh, that I, I wrote a book about the murder of an American journalist during the Greek Civil War, uh, a man named George Polk, after mm. whom the Polk Awards are, are uh, named. And, uh, and the official story was that he was killed by the communists. This was the beginning of the Cold War. And my book, The Polk Conspiracy, I recommend it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now available in paperback. Um, uh, un, um, I unraveled the official story and, and in fact, um, and led, led the crime to, uh, to, to Washington and London and our right-wing allies in Athens. Huh. So that's actually how I got involved in the Committee to Protect Journalists was I, after I wrote this book, I got a call saying, would you like to work on behalf of journalists other than those killed in Greece? And so, so we're, I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. We're, we don't discriminate against countries. We, uh, we discriminate against people who attack journalists. Okay, we'll start with this lady here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Reza, it's good to see you. I, Can you identify yourself? Oh, sure. My name is San Ali. I used to work with the Embassy of Pakistan uh, with Ambassador Sherry Rahman, who's uh, doing great media freedom uh, work as well uh, in Pakistan now. I'm a student at Johns Hopkins SAIS, and um, I actually am uh, very proud of the fact that in your career, you've spoken in Urdu, and you've spoken to the majority of people and made made a, uh, a lasting um, imprint in many conversations. That's something I hope to do as well in Pakistan, discuss all of these things. And you, you um, underscored the importance of a code of ethics, something that needs to exist. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about what is a better use of 
my energy? Should I be speaking on Ahmadi issues and, and Shia issues and the sectarian violence that's done? Or should we really start on a code of ethics? Is that something that uh, you know we really need to work on political parties? And I don't think you have the liberty of choosing. I think you need to do all of that at once. So my question to you is, what is it that um, the political parties who maybe aren't in power can be doing to solidify uh, these media rights? Is, is there something they can do on local levels, um, if maybe the Nawaz Sharif government has many federal concerns, are there other things other parties can be doing? Thank you. Good question. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, uh, because Pakistan's electronic media is a, a nascent uh, industry, and uh, it still ha does not have a code of ethics. And in fact, if you remember, that there were issues like uh, the uh, the television channels would show too much violence, body parts of a suicide bomber, and uh, you know which is not shown anywhere in the world. So then the parliament did intervene in the previous government, and they came up with a parliamentary committee suggested a code of conduct on what sorts of uh, things could be shown on television in terms you know in, in in the in the context of terrorism. And now after the uh, Mr. Mee's in incident, a parliamentary body has been formed. Uh, to look into uh, some of these guidelines uh, as to how uh, the TV channels should be reporting on certain issues. But I think the political parties have a fundamental role. They have been shirking uh, that role. I think this is the problem in Pakistan is that the traditional initiative of uh, governing the country was with the unelected institutions like the military and the civil bureaucracy uh, that the political parties and the political elites did not come forward and they they have shied away from that particular initiative and now you see some signs of that so i i agree with you yes the political parties have a role and in along these parliamentary commission types because that is where such debates must end up okay we're going to have resolution. this gentleman here and david sedney and this gentleman we're going to just do three we're going to start gathering questions because we're this gentleman start with yeah, my name is Steve Gozula. Last year I was in Pakistan, uh, chief of party for a USAID project on hydro and irrigation development in North Waziristan. A yeah. uh, couple of weeks ago in this very room, there was a presentation where they described Pakistan as having a Praetorian administration. It was an allusion to the Roman Empire, where the Senate could behave and function well, but if they misbehaved, they, the Praetorian Guard could step in. Mm. Um, mm. From what I'm hearing today, well, all the journalists are fighting among themselves and being killed by apparently the military establishment, the Taliban, would there be any way that journalists, as well as uniting as, as it has been proposed, you know, with, with a sort of universal code of ethics, any way that you could convince the military establishment, including the ISI, that you're a very valuable asset for Pakistan rather than a liability? Okay, yeah. good question. Mm. So, David. Thank you, uh, David Sedney. And I'm an currently an independent analyst and commentator. I did work for the U.S. government for 30 years, and I well, I think explain what your last job was. Uh, I was the deputy assistant secretary of defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia, and I certainly acknowledge uh, that we in the United States have many failings, including in the U.S. government. It's one of the reasons I re that's, one, that's one of the reasons one of the reasons I resigned from my job. Um, I uh, I want to. Uh, uh, Express my admiration, uh, Razor, for to you and to all the other Pakistani journalists. I'm not going to ask you any of the hard questions mm -hmm. uh, because I think it puts you in a difficult position. But I am going to ask uh, Peter and and uh, and the others uh, a question. Um, mm -hmm. First, the comment, however, I um, feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable discussing level playing fields <coughs> when on one side there's only five players and the other side there's about 20. The five players are running around in shorts and sneakers, and the other ones have AK-47s uh, and tanks, mortars, and stuff like that. And the more time you spend discussing the level playing field, the less you, pl less you pay attention to the real issue, in my view. And I, th I think this 
to, to be frank, I thought you spent too much time worrying about the playing, level playing field and not a tough time worrying about the reality here. I want to go back to uh, somebody who you had just here just a, f a few weeks ago, Peter. You had Carlotta Gall here, I think, on the same stage uh, talking about Pakistan as yeah. well. Um, and uh, tie that into a comment Reza made. He said that the anchors were, uh, were not run by the ISI. Well, that's, a, that's actually an interesting question. Because in addition to the instruments of force that you discuss, there's a lot of long history, uh, and many Pakistani journalists I know have talked to it, that the Pakistani intelligence services use positive incentives. They pay journalists. Yeah. They encourage them to write things uh, that are positive for the government. They, they encourage them to fight among each other. And so my question for you, Peter, and for the people from the committee, uh, is that besides the, uh, being against the killing of journalists, which uh, you do tremendous work on, what about helping journalists uh, become uh, good journalists, fair journalists, yeah. and resisting those kind of positive incentives? We will give you money. We will get your children in, uh, into a really good school. Uh, and by the way, if you don't, we'll kill you. Good question. Mm. Okay, this mm. gentleman here. Mm. Okay, we're, we're going to get to everybody. But make him short now, but he's running out of time. Hi, Idris Ali, uh, Pakistan Press Foundation. Um, could you talk about, you talked about Nawaz Sharif's meeting, and it sounded very optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, what, if any, mechanisms have you put in place to actually follow through on them? Because, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you know, governments previous seem to talk the talk, but, you know. Okay, great question. Yeah. Up on that. Yep. Uh, Jonathan Landy from uh, McClatchy. Um, in to December 2007, uh, none of these uh, media owners or their channels had any qualms about rebroadcasting Benazir Bhutto's unproven claims that men around uh, President uh, and General Musharraf were mm -hmm. responsible for trying to kill her in Karachi. And they didn't just do that for eight hours. They went on and on and on and on. And, and mm -hmm. that's still the case today. Yet, so, so to my question is, to what extent are the, the media owners other than GEO using Hamid Mir's, the attack on Hamid Mir as an opportunity not just to suck up to the army, but also to try and increase their own audience share? Okay, <laughs> mm. good question. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. This lady here, and then this lady. Hi, M uh, I'm Tahira Noor, I'm from Pakistan. I'm a Fulbright Fellow here and work with World Bank as a focal person for Universal Healthcare Program. Raja, I'm very happy to see you alive here. Welcome to the safest land on earth. My question is, uh, soon after this Hamid Mir incident, we saw media fraternity divided. And at the same time, we also saw that Prime Minister is going to see Hamid Mir and Chief of Army, is, Chief of Army staff is going to see his DGISI. So what do you think? Who was, uh, what kind of a mes message that both were conveying to whom? Was the political opinion also divided, the way media fraternity was divided? Okay, this lady here. Hi, uh, my name is Sahar Gul. I'm a researcher on, on extremism and radical Islam since uh, 2006. And my question is from uh, Raza Rumi about the role of PAMBRA. That is there any, do you have an idea that there's history of uh, PAMBRA that has been you know, monitoring TV channels? and then taking action against them. Because I have been doing research on religious uh, TV channels since 2009 to this date. And uh, I have very interesting findings and hate speech, and I have been just you know, contacting PAMRA. I went over there. They gave me time, and I was you know, waiting for them to meet, and they didn't do anything. And so I shared very interesting things they could have taken action against. So, so what do you think that what should be done in this regard? Okay. And the final question is over here. Yeah, yeah I'm taking Thank you so stage. much. Uh, my question is from Reza. My, my name is Sher Zaman. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I came here, I, I'm in Virginia from last nine months, majoring in media and communication. As Reza talked about various challenges which journalists are currently facing in Pakistan. So what, Reza, you would recommend for a fresh journalist like me who is going back in Pakistan in uh, upcoming one or two months? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, there's a lot of good questions. I mean, are there, yeah. are, the, uh, are there any ones that you want to respond to? And then I'll prompt you with ones if, if we don't get uh, I think I can respond to <laughs> talk a little bit about the follow-up. And I can also talk a little bit about um, uh, the uh, um, challenge of dealing with uh, corruption and yeah. pressure in the media and how, okay. we, how we manage yeah. that. Yeah, press standards. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And 
Should I Go for take it, it away? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, first on the uh, follow-up, I mean, one of the things that we did is we memorialized all the commitments that the Prime Minister made to us, and I think we've left that. Uh, uh, oh, there's some copies outside if you want to take that. And we distributed th those commitments to all the um, uh, key actors, including uh, diplomatic community, officials, uh, civil society, um, uh, diplomatic community, and we've asked them to uh, follow up and, and hold the government to account on these uh, commitments, the specific commi commitments that were made. We obviously will be doing the same, and, uh, but, but it's not something that we can, we can do sing single-handedly. The question is, how broadly will the commitments that were made very publicly, which were memorialized and concretized, be adopted more broadly by the media community and the interests that are defending the media. That's what we're going to see. That's, that's the strategy. Can I add okay. to, to yep. that? Uh, um, after um, this session, I'm uh, going to the State Department to, to uh, meet with, um, with Ambassador Dobbins, who is in charge of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan for this administration. And I do believe that to reach that, that magic tipping point, you do have to attack from every angle. And, and therefore, um, I think it's very important for us to, to have the support of, uh, of the State Department and the White House in, in, um, uh, in their dealings with, with Pakistan, as, as unpopular as the United States is in Pakistan. I think we do still have a, a certain amount of uh, leverage. So we're, we're certainly enlisting um, um, the, the support of the State Department. Um, and then tomorrow I'm meeting with, uh, with, with your boss, Ambassador Jelani, um, to talk about uh, follow-ups to, um, to our trip. And, um, and, and plus, we, we made it very clear that, uh, that we would be returning. So that has them scared. <laughs> <laughs> We're always come back. And yes. The, the corruption oh, and, issue. and on the corruption yeah, issue. Yeah. Well, you. the corruption issue. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I really agree with your analysis. I think it's important that you brought it up. I'm yeah. afraid I'm not going to give you a very satisfying answer because the issue is tremendously complex. Basically, my answer is that the media in every society that I see reflects the dysfunctionalities of that society, including our own. <laughs> and, and, and Pakistan is no exception. But let me give you another example where corruption of the media is an overwhelming problem in the context of this issue: Mexico. Okay. There, the, ch the dynamic is very different. You have drug traffickers basically making the same offer. Either you write about us in a positive way and we pay you, or you don't write about us and we kill you. The, the, you know, and in, 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 in Pakistan, I, you describe the dynamic very well, but it's different. Um, so what I would say is it's an immensely complex issue. Um, it's one that we have to address in different ways in different societies, but the fundamental thing you need to do in this context is make sure that the government meets its responsibilities. And that responsibility means that when there is violence committed against the press, regardless of the circumstances, when a journalist is killed, there needs to be a systematic, comprehensive investigation, and those responsible need to be brought to justice. And that's the, the, the single most important message that we need to deliver over and over and over again. And we can't allow any contextual uh, 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 variables to detract from that clear, defined responsibility that the government has. And I, I just want to add that, that um, the best cure for um, corruptible journalists is to pay journalists a living wage. Mm. And, um, and so insofar as we have any voice at all, any influence at all uh, with, uh, with, <laughs> with uh, media owners, um, we need to drive home the point that, uh, that, that journalists um, need to be paid what, uh, what the market bears. Razor, final thoughts? on Yeah, just, uh, I'll just address that. I think uh, what you uh, mentioned about uh, the uh, politics uh, following the attack on Hamid Mir is absolutely spot on because, you know, it has become a kind of a civil military uh, tension point. And the fact that the Prime Minister and his ministers uh, were backing uh, the GOTV network uh, rather clearly uh, and, so, and, and solidly for, for many days uh, was viewed as a sign that somewhere within uh, the civilian government was siding with the stance of GOTV being, uh, you know, and, and, and being hard on the ISI. 
and uh, some conspiracy theorists uh, again on the rival TV channels went to the extent of saying that it was a plot by the Prime Minister and his party when, uh, and it is a conspiracy mind you. So, to, to actually do all of this to get the, to remove the DGISI from scene you know from the scene. So, I mean I do not buy that, but, but the <laughs> issue here is that yes that split has also come into play and that has also muddled the waters and, and, uh, uh, and you are absolutely right uh, about uh, the corporate interests. I think they are reigning supreme beneath all this talk about patriotism and, and etc and, and defense. It is about the fact that the other media houses of Pakistan are sensing that the big beast may actually be expelled from the room and they will have all the advertising shares. Yeah. So, they are pushing and gunning for it, ban it, it is unpatriotic, wow. it is an agent of the Indians and the West and blah blah blah. So, you have this whole narrative on, on television uh, and, and, and at the core of it for, for the media industry is the profit and corporate interest. You know, you, I think you know, the more you know about Pakistan, the less you know about it. But we have the best possible panel to discuss this and in a way this is really, this subject as Caddy said is about the future of Pakistan in a lot of ways because it's it. it uh, so I want to thank Caddy and Reza and Joel for their t insights and times. This is one of the most lively panels we've had. Thank you all <laughs> thank for you, your excellent you. questions. Thank you.